Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for the kind invitation and, and the invitation to be here uh, today. It's, it's been a fantastic day and thank you all, first of all, to, uh, for, for coming here on a Saturday, Saturday afternoon that shows the passion for the, uh, for the quantum world. Um, I'll finish off with, uh, with a, a proposed title, which was Quantum Optics to Quantum Technology, and I thought I'll take that as an opportunity to give a perhaps slightly, uh, let's say, light uh, talk on that, that links the history of quantum optics and how it has led to uh, numerous quantum technologies and where it can lead to as well. So hopefully at the end of the, 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 the talk, uh, the take home message is what we had to develop as tools uh, of, to understand matter, isolated quantum objects like trapped ions, for example, for the first time or individual atoms. That, sand, that, that toolbox itself has become our sandpit to understand how we can develop new technologies. And even today, um, Barbara's beautiful talk is, is actually a lot of underlying quantum optics tools uh, in, in, in the process. All the operations we do on qubits, two qubit gates, all of that is developed from uh, what we've done with, uh, with quantum optics. But I'll extend this uh, to, to, uh, to f this, as much as I can on uh, what the impact is. So let me start with... Um, Actually, a very uh, simple question, and, uh, and hopefully this will highlight why this has all been so exciting to, to go in the, in the realm of various applications, including quantum networks, all right? So let's start with the concept of creating correlations. If I need to, if, if I need to identify matter, I would say it is formed by putting many, many, many things together, like atoms, but just because they happen to be around each other is not enough to form a, a, a solid or a liquid or a gas, right? The phase of matter arises only because you have interaction. Interaction leads to correlated states and that correlated state co combined leads to a, a collective phase and now we have a matter, a large scale matter. So it all starts with this. Let me see if this works. It all starts with this. You take two objects, you bring them together and you let them interact. If they're Negative, if, if they're interacting attractively, they might form a bound state together, right? That's the formation of a molecule. But the whole point then is the word proximity. It's a, it's a, it's an, I think it's an underappreciated technical term in science. Proximity means there is a length scale characteristic, length scale required so that you can induce interactions to have the right strength of interactions so that that system now cannot be, tr be treated as this red blob I'm a physicist, so red blobs are perfectly fine for me as physical objects. This red blob and that red blob, but rather a, a two red blob object, like a molecule, right? So, I, I, so for whatever your, your uh, interaction of choice is, electricity, magnetism, anything else, there is a characteristic length scale that defines what this word means to you, proximity, okay? Every matter that you know relies on this and has a, has a corresponding word proximity. There is one and only one example I can find, and please help me if you have other examples, but there is one and only example I can find where I can beat the concept of proximity and still create a correlated state, as a single entity. And that is, if this red ball has a, has a red hue or a pink hue around it, what does that mean? It means it can couple, this red blob can couple to light, some electromagnetic radiation. And if that radiation can be exchanged with another red blob, I no longer care about proximity, physical distance between the two red blobs. What I care about now is what is the efficiency of taking this energy, this energy exchange between the two, uh, fr from this one to that one with sufficiently strong, uh, let's say, interaction. So you wouldn't think of the actual physical distance between these two objects, but you would think of a, let me draw a virtual uh, curved mirror here and a curved mirror here. You can think of a big cavity, optical cavity, and you put two red blobs where the red blobs are at the anti-nodes of the cavity mode. So then you're interacting through this one common, well-defined uh, optical field uh, trapped inside this, this cavity. So then I don't care how far these are as long as they're both individually talking to a common object, which is now the radiation mode. If I have that, I can create strong interactions between these two objects through exchange of radiation, energy, without the need for proximity. That's the only example I can find. Help me if you, uh, if you happen to know another one. Now that's a material property. That's how I will justify matter-light interaction, the heart of quantum optics. That that is just one example of why it's worth studying this, why it was, it's interesting 
to go in that direction to create correlated systems that do not obey our notion of proximity requirement or how things are laid out in physical space. You can imagine not two, but two million of these things. If I have these one-to-one -one couplings of two million, instead of creating two million of these ones based on lining them up one by one to create a lattice, I'm now talking about arbitrarily located atoms, all linked strongly, creating the effect of the phase of a solid, for example, without looking anything like the ordered solid that I, I know. As long as I keep track of each one, I'm building up a topology that is independent of the real space, essentially. So that's attractive for its own merit. But that's, that's busy, right? I have to have, if it's two million of these, I have to have one million cavities, optical cavities, to identify modes and all that. There is something else quantum physics can give us. And it's the concept of never even interacting in the first place, right? This, the concept of quantum erasure, where you make a measurement to f not find out about the answer. But in the process, you make sure that no one else finds out about the answer either. Okay, that's as, as colloquial as I can make it. You want to erase the information in such a way that you create the ambiguity in colloquial terms or superposition state in, in more technical terms. Now, how does that work? You have your two red balls with the pink hue again. The pink hue allows them to, uh, to couple to well-defined modes, optical modes, but then there's a third party. A third party that looks at the photons, or even in some cases, the probability of photons coming. It's not even real light, but the probability of the light might, uh, a light might come uh, this way. And as long as this, this eye over here cannot tell the difference between these clearly distinguishable arrows, but let's say that it does a special trick over here and completely confuses that information, then you can end up creating, if you're lucky, if you do it the right way, you can end up creating correlations between these two red blobs without the need for each of them being uh, particularly positioned anywhere. And of course, again, no uh, link to their proximity. So imagine this eye over here, like a puppet master, with all the strings attached, strings being light strings, to, to create pairwise correlations on a large ensemble of, let's say, two million of these guys. And again, the same concept that we talked about over here of two million atoms uh, uh, with, with an emergent correlation at the end of it with a certain solid phase. I can do this by literally being one control unit, controlling all of the atoms, dialing them up pairwise, through pairwise interactions, entanglement, or correlations, and then I create this, this new phase of matter uh, that isn't linked to where they are, but rather to the topology, to, to, the, the index map. All right? That's attractive, to be able to create matter at will, or, or engineer, synthesize matter at will by programming, rather than bringing things together. When we synthesize matter now, we're, we're in a very advanced stage of, of making new materials in the lab, we're always doing this. This is all we do. We bring atoms that wouldn't normally naturally exist, we bring them together and now we have a new material. This, if we can achieve this over a very large scalable format, we're, we'll be making materials and studying their response uh, without ever actually putting things together in the lab. See how attractive that is? I could have, I could have stood up here and the first slide, slide could have been, quantum networks are exciting, we'd like to do quantum networks, but I didn't. There is more to it if we can get to the large scaling uh, than just building quantum networks for an application. So it's good for science as well, to, to our understanding of, of matter. So let me go back to, again, this history. We always treat it as, you know, fundamental science. Science leads to technology. You develop science, probably out of curiosity, blue skies research, and then you find a, a way to use it for, for some application, and you develop business based on that, right? And this, this is a very nice, this is from Optical Society of America uh, website. It's a, it's a nice flow of, I would say, randomly highlighted uh, advances in quantum physics, mostly related to light of some sort. And it, it, of course, it all starts as with our usual, uh, let's say, mainstream education. It all starts with Planck's black body radiation, uh, and then the photoelectric effect, where he got the Nobel Prize for it, and so on and so forth. But I'm, I'm adding here, which I'm going to use later on, I'm adding here one more date, 1875, uh, Heinrich Weber. Does, does anyone know what Mr. Weber did? Mr. Weber measured the heat capacity of things. And he has actually he was one of the people that showed that heat capacity of things is quite boring because it always comes out roughly the same value, three times a, a constant, 3R or 3KB, Boltzmann constant in the end. So it's like, it doesn't matter what temperature you look at, every material is roughly the same. What is heat capacity? How much energy do I put in 
so that the temperature of this matter, of this object, goes up by one degree? Simple question. What he showed in 1875, now this is prior to cryogenic experiments. This is prior to uh, liquid helium, liquid nitrogen, right? So 1875, he had to wait for winter to do the experiments so that he can get some ice in large, large quantities to do the experiments. And summertime is, you know, now here we say summertime is research time for us, but actually summertime then it wasn't research time. <laughs> so what he showed was diamond specific heat was temperature dependent. So how much energy you need to put in to increase temperature by one degree depended on what temperature you start out with. And that's, that's odd because classical physics does not explain that at all. So that was something wrong. And what made Einstein tip to the side of quantum for photoelectric effect 1905 and the concept of quantized radiation was when he realized that he can explain what happened to diamond specific heat by quantized vibrations, phonons. So once he saw that fundamental uh, particles, the way we describe things, if we quant quantize them, we do see things that match with uh, uh, physical reality. Uh, that was it. He said, okay, so we're gonna go through this, this particle nature of radiations and waves, and that, that triggered it. So that's the, the, the photoelectric effect. I wanted to say diamond in here because I'm gonna use diamond later on in the talk. So it's gonna come back. Diamond has played a key part in many, uh, in, in, in many advances today. And here what you're seeing is in, 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 in uh, astonishing 100 years, we're talking about quantum advantage as, uh, as, as something that's realizable in the lab, in the first experiments. And then what will happen, of course, is uh, you will show, demonstrate quantum advantage. Then they will demonstrate a better algorithm classically that beats it. And then there will be another quantum advantage demonstration and so on and so forth. So both classical and quantum world, uh, worlds pro propagate. But that's for the computing part. The expected from science to technology, from curiosity to science, we've seen, but science to technology, there are generally three areas in quantum technologies that, uh, that we would talk about. One is computing and simulation. Another one is net, uh, communications and networks. And the third one is sensors and metrology. So what I'll try to show is a bit of glimpse of where we are, particularly with a, a material system like diamond for, uh, for all three of these, all right? And this is what was expected in 2020 that we would have inter intra city communications uh, till uh, 2030 onwards and quantum internet in 2035 plus and annealers uh, up to here, so on and so forth. So there, you know, we, we've moved on from curiosity to actually doing things with a, with a reasonably well-defined roadmap. But it goes down again, the, the topic was quantum optics. So how does quantum optics come into this? It boils down to actually this, this work by these two uh, gentlemen, Demelt and Paul, developed a way to actually finally trap a single quantum object. Until that time, they got the Nobel Prize in 1989, the work was earlier, but until that time we, we had beams of atoms passing by when you heat a, 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 an oven and then atoms escape. It was, it was never a single isolated quantum object sitting somewhere where you can talk to and, and do, do work with it and, 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 and study its properties and whatnot. So it's the first work that actually uh, trapped a single ion, you remove an electron, you have a charged particle, you create an electro, uh, electromagnetic uh, uh, trap potential, and the, the ion just sits there and can't move. And actually now, these days, it sits there for hours and hours, so it's the same ion all the time. They trapped, and if you, if you look, by the way, it's a little anecdote, uh, this, is, this was his original signature, Demel's original signature, and after he trapped it, he added that to his signature. That is the ion in the middle, and that's the trap. That's how he's actually trapping a single ion. So he changed his own signature because, of the, because he realized the importance of this discovery. A second Nobel Prize uh, topic was on not trapping that single ion, but introducing the full quantum control tools that we have to be able to control these quantum individual quantum systems. So isolating the quantum object from the classical actually has been only quite recently. It hasn't been, uh, you know, since the 1900s. The concepts, the, the curiosity part goes back to 1900 early, but actually being able to play with these things in the lab, isolated, is actually not that far off, right? This is only, only in the last 30, 40 years we have access to it. Well, laser is 1960, so we wouldn't have the lasers anyways. We, you, know, uh, you wouldn't be able to do this. So this is uh, Demel's signature. 
You see the trapped iron right there, this is from Oxford Group, trapped iron group, and this is the, the, the equipment that goes around it to trap it in, in vacuum, in isolated vacuum. And then you do all your operations with it, the ground state is, is, is spin active, so you, have, you can code information into the, into the internal states of the iron, is a qubit, and it has optical transition, so light comes out, and the light that comes out is related to the internal degrees of freedom. That's the, so in other words, that's the red blob. And the, the pink hue is the photon that comes out of it, right? So that's what it actually looks like, those red blobs. There are um, many realizations of quantum objects now, isolated quantum objects, so trapped ions or, or, or atoms is the, is the one that we start out with. Photos themselves, as we know, uh, you can't really trap them anywhere. They, they tend to travel at the speed of light. Uh, but they're quantum objects, individual quantum objects, and early quantum optics experiments relied heavily on photons using nonlinear optics, actually. Parametric down conversion was a process that generated entangled photons. Um, spins located in solids, uh, superconducting systems based on Josephson junctions, cold atoms in, in, um, uh, in optical lattices to create artificial uh, uh, lattice structures and whatnot. These are all different platforms we now have that I can say are isolated quantum objects we can access and measure. And any other, uh, even though I say isolated, any other leftover interactions they have with the rest of the environment will treat them as, uh, as dephasing or, or coupling to the environment. But, the, but the, the coupling is strong enough to us that they survive as, as strong, promising candidates to, uh, to realize applications with. This is that red blob and the, and the pink hue again. If you have a solid state system rather than a trapped ion, a, a single electron spin, for example, inside, buried inside a matter that is otherwise spin vacuum, that does not have any containing spin, this little guy over here trapped, if it is connected to photons, that gives you this spin photon interface, or is this um, the, the red ball with the pink hue. Why is that relevant? In the same concept as I was promoting quantum networks, you can then couple these, these blobs to each other by quantum uh, radiation, by quantum light, and each of these blobs can, be, can compromise a, effectively a processor qubit, something that's your, your, your controlled qubit that you're interested in, and coupling to, to the uh, photons that transmit the information back and forth between different levels. In order to operate efficiently, you need more than one qubit. So you actually need a local registry uh, nearby. And physical realization for these things usually, and this is, this is uh, the fashion of the day, is usually photons interacting with a single electronic spin, well-defined electronic spin in a solid, with a nearby nuclear spin ensemble that we can access, three, four, five, seven, whatever. And you can, the, the electron talks to the nuclear spins, you can encode information in the nuclear spin, store it, nuclear spins are well isolated, so they're quiet, so you can store information for a long time, whereas your electronic spin is fast, so it actually is good for processing and distributing information, essentially. So what kind of a material system can host uh, this, this trio? Turns out diamond is a good one, and, uh, and Delta is a, one of the leading uh, places for, for diamonds. I'm very happy to follow Barbara for this. Um, normally when I say diamond, this is what you think of, right? All the colors that you can imagine. But actually the diamond we work with, the diamond I really like is this one, where there's absolutely no color. Because color in diamond means anything but diamond. So if diamond is colorless, what makes these diamonds interesting is their impurities. Their, how much you deviate from actual pure diamond is what makes it attractive, so we like our impurities. Depending on the color, you get different, uh, depending on the atoms you put other than carbon, you get a different color. Uh, pink is nitrogen, so if you put a lot of nitrogen inside the carbon lattice, you get pink. If you put silicon in, in the carbon lattice, you get yellow. And uh, if you put boron, you get more bluish uh, light out. So next time you go to a museum or something, you see a nice big diamond piece and it's got a hue, you know what atoms are there. They take it away from pure diamond to give its color. The thing that's interesting is to actually, is, is to work with these diamonds, pink, pink hue, but only one atom at a time, well separated from each other. So I have, just like a trapped ion, I only have one atom with the one electron that I'm going to talk to, but nothing around it. So when I con interact with it, it's completely isolated as a quantum object. And that's called a nitrogen vacancy center. It forms in diamond, it's pure diamond, but instead of 
two carbon, uh, carbon side by side, two neighbors, you remove one and replace it with a nitrogen, and then you remove the neighboring carbon, you don't put anything in there. That, called the nitrogen and a vacancy combined, is optically active. It has a spin, ground state, with some uh, splitting, so it has some structure, but it's got an active spin in the ground state, and optical transitions that link that spin to photons. That's all we need to know. Once we have that, we can start generating effectively this concept of linking those, each one of those nitrogen vacancies is from Jeff Kimball's uh, paper called The Quantum Internet. Uh, he was very kind to show us these uh, squares and red arrows and said, if you have squares, cubes, and red arrows, you're done. You can build a quantum internet. No one understood what an arrow is, and we've been st struggling ever since to build this thing up. <laughs> but if you put a nitrogen vacancy center here, one atomistic defect here, and photons that come from it, as the red arrows, you're, you're, you're there. Essentially, that's the, the motivation. All right. And that's exactly what Delft did. Uh, Ronald Hansen's group and, 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 and a large team and collaborators have actually used, uh, created this A, B, C, three locations where nitrogen vacancy centers, these little diamond chips, are distributed in different locations, and by simply exchanging light, they were able to create entanglement, correlations, between these two spins that are not proximal to each other. The only thing that mattered was taking the light from this point to that point, or this point to that point. But being able to do this, they removed this, they, they created a three-particle correlated state without the need for particles to ever coming together to interact with each other, and that's the power of quantum network. And through this, of course, one of the things they've realized beautifully is going back to this concept of uh, 1992, 93, amazing idea of using, uh, using entanglement to do something. I think, if I'm not mistaken, this might be one of the first examples of, here is quantum entanglement, what can we do with it? And they came up with quantum teleportation as, as something that, that could be achieved if you have a resource of entangled, uh, entangled particles in two different locations. So if you provide that as a resource, you can then use it to, trans to teleport information from A to B instantaneously. That was the, that was the claim. So coming back to this, so we, do we have a quantum network? Yes, we do. We have a three-node quantum network now. There's only one. It's in Delft. We have a three-node quantum network. It's operational, it's working, and it's based on diamond. These are color centers, quantum objects in diamond. So that was, I, I give that as an example for communications and networks. I'm going to move to computing and simulation, the, the computing side, uh, following on from Diamond, actually. Um, as we know, there are two, let's say, two mainstream ways uh, quantum computing is, is viewed. You can have the circuit-based approach, the, uh, the, the more obvious one. And then there is this measurement-based uh, approach, where it, it requires providing resource into the system. Uh, rather than controlling every single qubit, you, as long as you're able to dump the overhead of controlling all the qubits to the beginning of generating uh, entanglement and feeding into a system, as long as you're able to do that, then, uh, then you should be able to do a measurement-based uh, quantum computation. And photons are more suitable for this, because this doesn't require immediately interactions. It relies on measurement. We can measure photons. We can't get photons to interact with each other efficiently. This requires interactions. It's difficult to make interactions for photons, but there's a way. And the way people have achieved it is using setups that look like this. This is purely for photon, uh, uh, photon, photon interaction setups. This is a uh, photons going through. This is called a probabilistic uh, quantum computation approach. Uh, you use beam splitters, you use multiple options to actually a, a full linear optic circuit, circuitry, and you pass your photons through, and on the end, you make a measurement. You, you make many measurements, actually, but simultaneously. If you have made certain measurements and the outcome was, uh, was a certain prediction that you had, then it means the, the, the channels you haven't measured are in a particular quantum state. So you can predict that quantum state with certainty if the other measurements give you the right condition. So it's a conditional measurement. You have to make some measurements. You fail most of the time because the whole thing is probabilistic with beam splitters and all that. In fact, it looks, kind of looks like that. That's what the setups will look like. These are all sources, non-deterministic sources. So sometimes you generate a photon, sometimes you don't. Non-deterministic logic case, these are beam splitters. Sometimes they go left, sometimes they go right. So there's an ambiguity. But in the end, 
These are the uh, detection systems. If you detect the right combination, the outcome is correct. That's what. So, uh, if you know the movie Anchorman, it's it's sixty percent of the time it's accurate all the time. That's the that's the phrase from the from the movie. So there's a there's a low yield, but when you when you when you made those measurements, you are hundred percent sure it's it it worked. All right, sixty percent of the time it works all the time. This is a map. So this is on-chip quantum computation, one-way quantum computation approach. You feed the photons from one side, it goes through a process of a well-defined chip, and it gives you an answer, like random walk questions or traveling salesman questions, whatever, boson sampling. What I'm plotting here is complexity, number of components on chip. Complexity is a function of year for the non-deterministic, probabilistic uh, approach. And what you're seeing here is first initial test, and then it kind of goes exponential. Kind of like a Moore's law kind of thing, right? This number of components on chip where people have demonstrated many things, Bristol being one of the key players in this, uh, in this whole business. And this, is, this exponential rate of um, component density is, is good and not good, okay, at the same time. It's good because, hey, any, if we can increase our complexity of our devices exponentially, that must be good, right? That's progress. It's also not good because we have to increase it exponentially to get to the next level of complexity. The whole point was that we beat exponential need. You want exponential ability, but you don't want exponential need. At the moment, it looks like to go to the next complexity, you do need the exponential growth. So in a way, the fact that we are able to do it is good, but the fact that it's needed is not good. You want to beat the, prob the, the exponential growth of vanishing let's say, uh, probability, the, the exponential growth of the, the issue of vanishing probability. So how can you fix that? You can sprinkle, so one logic, one concept here is, let me go back to the circuit. Let me see where it is, there we go. Imagine you take this circuit, all probabilistic circuit, and you sprinkle a few deterministic gates in there, if you had, if you had deterministic gates, if you sprinkle a few, you are going to beat this pure exponential uh, uh, behavior. So there's advantage in trying to put something that takes light and another light takes two photons and it interacts with them deterministically if you can. Right? Even that, even a, a fraction of that uh, in, in that uh, in that circuit would be helpful. So how can we help with that? Another color center in diamond, silicon, the one that gives the yellow uh, yellow uh, greenish hue, is actually well suited for this. It has very sharp optical transitions. Uh, when you cool it down. It has very good spin, spin one-half system. It's integratable, unlike the NV center, it's, it's better integratable into, uh, let me see if I get to this. It's better integratable into uh, nanostructures without suffering from charge surface effects, all the material science complexities that come from actual physical package devices. The NV center is good when you leave it alone, but because it has an actual electric dipole, any charge fluctuations disturbs the quality of, the, uh, of, of, the, of this quantum object, whereas these, uh, instead of nitrogen vacancy, the silicon vacancy, tin vacancy, germanium vacancy, all these group four category in the periodic table, they're centrosymmetric. So it doesn't matter if there's charge fluctuations, it doesn't matter if you, are, you have a noisy environment, they're quiet, they don't see it. So they work with just the spin part of the story. As long as there's no magnetic noise, they're happy. So that means you can actually take these, uh, these group four color centers and put them in very complicated structures, mem membranes or, or uh, these cantilevers, uh, these little diamond chiplets, for example, is something we're working with. Uh, each one is a waveguide. Each one has a single emitter in the middle right here. And you can take this whole unit in diamond. You can etch diamond, create this unit, break it off, literally, and then come and place it into your fully integrated uh, aluminum nitride, silicon nitride, photonic chip, very large photonic chip. So this chip that I have shown here, going back, where, that one, you can imagine that if we had, you know, how I, I prepared uh, the, the, the uh, framework for it, I said if this could be, for example, randomly selected, this one could be deterministic, how we're going to do that in the circuit, well, if you leave that space empty when you're fabricating this whole chip of silicon nitride and you take your diamond chiplet and you just carry it over and plug it in there, I think it was this one, you plug it in there, you have it. So you have a deterministic quantum object in your otherwise probabilistic circuit to enhance uh, the uh, operation capacity. And that's 
that's the concept here. Again, these triplets will sit in circuits and they will operate as photon-photon interaction gates. Again, borrowing from a concept in quantum optics. The, the, the two-level system will only interact with one photon at a time. So if in the presence of an excitation or not, the photon is transmitted or reflected, that's a control beam splitter uh, choice, effectively, and done deterministically. And you can pl plug these triplets into uh, microchip sockets, as, as, as you can see before, uh, uh, here. And the idea is these are waveguides. They come in, interact, and come out. These are your deterministic beam splitters all folded into one, so there's a good scalable uh, approach to doing this. Or you can put this in electrical circuits uh, and, and control spin and, and, and link it to uh, current. All right, so the future is, uh, let's say, bright for, for diamond for that purpose. And now I want to come back to this guy, the third one. We talked about computing. We just talked about where there could be an impact on the computing side. There's an impact on the networking side. And diamond could be relevant also for the sensor side. So a few words on, on that. So what, what could be attractive on the sensing side? Well, the ground state is a spin, right? It's a spin-active molecule. In nature, it's not easy to find these things. In nature, when you talk about single molecules or other things, the ground state is usually a singlet. It's a nice isolated singlet. Spin-active states are usually higher in energy with a finite lifetime before they decay to this stable, spinless uh, ground state. NV center in diamond, I'm gonna go back to the NV center. NV center in, di in diamond is one of those rare cases where the ground state is spin active. So there is an active spin sitting there exploring the magnetic field. That's why we can talk to it. All the tools of quantum optics uh, in lasers, microwaves, radio waves to access these spins. And going back to the old books of NMR to pick up protocols, develop protocols to understand things better and how, how to operate with spins, it's all in there. And what, what area that uh, this, uh, the spin, uh, this, this excess, optical access to spin can have impact on is spin-based imaging. So here, uh, the, the MRI, magnetic resonance imaging, or NMR, nuclear magnetic resonance, they're the same things. For those who may not have noticed, they're exactly the same things, it's just that public doesn't like the word nuclear. So instead of nuclear magnetic resonance, you do that in your lab for research, and when you're ready to translate it to, uh, to healthcare, it becomes nuclear magnetic resonance, and you swallow the word nuclear there. But it is nuclear because, not because there's anything radioactive, but because the protons, the nuclei, are processing in a magnetic field. They process and generate a magnetic field themselves because they're processing at a certain frequency, precession frequency, and you pick it up with a coil on the side. So you check how many protons are around and where they are. And from that, you can deduce what material is in there. And actually, that's, it's pretty impressive that you can build up a whole image based on where your coil is looking. The good thing about that is we can actually see inside us by the signal actually coming from us, not externally. We don't, we don't do something to us. It's the natural response of our body, and that's fa fantastic. The downside is we have a resolution of about a millimeter because the integration volume you need to develop enough signal to detect is, is set by how insensitive your nuclear spins are. Tiny. Nuclear spins are a thousandth of that of an electron. So that's why it makes it hard to actually detect. And that maps your detection volume, the smallest volume you can actually capture uh, a detectable signal. So you want to make this smaller and smaller is to, to be able to see finer and finer. That's what we'd like to do. And there are many attempts. Well, what I'll do is I'll highlight how diamond uh, could come in handy with this. So let's take a look at those ground states that I didn't really talk about much. This was the optical transitions of the NV center in diamond. If I look over here closely, I said 2.9 gigahertz split. This is what it looks like. This is one spin state, this is another spin state. In reality, this is, it's a spin triplet. So this is the ms equals zero triplet. This is the ms equals plus and minus one uh, part of the triplet. So it's a degenerate two levels. And you can imagine that if I apply a magnetic field, the plus one is gonna go up, the minus one is gonna come down. So it's gonna be a three level system, yeah? But Given that we have optical transitions, we can actually probe the, prob the fraction of the MS0 state versus MS plus and minus one states optically. I can actually record that optically. That's why we have a quantum network, because we can read out the spin state of our qubit efficiently. If that's the case, I can use the same thing to say, OK, if, I'm, if I pass a microwave, Pure, I'm doing pure quantum optics now, in the good old you know, quantum optics, uh, the way it was done, even pre-lasers, by the way, when, when people identified the spin nature of, of atoms, that's, that's another Nobel Prize, 
Uh, so quantum optics has, has, been, you know, has received attention. Uh, so as you sweep microwaves, when you hit the right frequency, you're distributing the, uh, the population here. You're shuffling the population. If you shuffle the population, the intensity of light that you see on the, uh, from the nitrogen vacancy center drops and comes back, or it, it's altered. That alteration, when you actually actively externally disturb that spin population, is a signature of where that transition is in microwaves. So my accuracy is not even the optics anymore. It's the, the quality of my, my microwave frequency I'm sending, which could be subhertz, right? So I have very high precision of telling where that transition, that splitting is. So if there is a magnetic field, ambient magnetic field, what's going to happen is that, as I said before, the MS plus one state shoots up a bit. MS minus one, I'm done, what happened to the one here? MS minus one state goes down a bit. So that, that resonance that I had in the middle right here is now turned into a doublet, okay? So from the splitting of the doublet, I know the magnetic field that the NV sees. Great. Let's see. So here's an um, a, a undergraduate lab demo of the NV center measuring magnetic fields. As you apply Gauss, in units of Gauss, meaning small, that's what I'm going to say. If you're, if you're using units of Gauss, that means you're measuring a very small magnetic field. And what you're seeing is this, this state is splitting up into more and more split doublets as you apply more and more field to the ND center. Okay? So it's a, it's a direct measurement. You can actually see this. So how can I use this? That magnetic field need not be coming from an external field we apply. It might be a nearby spin. So if I want to detect the presence of a spin that isn't coupled to light, what am I going to do? I can't use MRI or NMR because the, the signal is not strong enough, but I can bring an NV center nearby and its magnetic field of this one spin will split, to what extent I don't know, but it will split this transition and I should be able to detect down to single spins. Okay? Magnetic field down to a single spin. And it turns out that even, even light uh, 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 even heat is something detectable, so you can talk about nanothermometry with NV centers. But that's just to keep in mind that there's multiple modalities for this. So this is called optically detected magnetic resonance. So it's not magnetic resonance imaging the way we did it, using the uh, signal from the spins processing together in a finite field, but rather optically reading out what your NV center tells you or what your physical system tells you. And it actually it goes all the way to 1920s with mercury vapor. So it's, again, atomic physics optics and atomic physics combined together to give us first applications of optically detected magnetic resonance, internal degrees of freedom, and it goes somewhere here is the optical detection of single emitter, this is the ions, right, 1980s, that's where first time we actually see single quantum objects, and NV, on some, NV magnetometry, nitrogen vacancy center magnetometry is literally in the last 10 years, it's amazing it's been 10 years already, but it's, it's only been around for about 10 years or so. How does it perform now? This is a nice map. I like this map. It's magnetic field sensitivity. How sensitive are you to a strength of a magnetic field that's, that's, uh, that you're seeing, you're exposing the NV to? And this is the characteristic size. How big of an area do you need to integrate to get that uh, um, uh, signal? Or how far are you from the source, essentially? And there are many, many different micro hole sensors, the single electron spin. Uh, th this, these are squids. Uh, four sensors, there are many different approaches to it. This is the, the typical NV performance area. So it's not the best in terms of sensitivity by measure of the, of the value here, magnetic fields, nan nano Tesla per root hertz, but it is actually one of the closest things you can be to an object that you're trying to detect. The diagonal lines are, are informative. This line is the compromise of distance versus field sensitivity required. This line is one million electron spins. If you wanted to detect signal from one million electron spins, this line is all you care about. So you're, you're here and you're safe. If you want 1,000 electron spins, signal correspond to 1,000, you need to drop down to this level of sensitivity or uh, target, uh, detect the target separation. This is one electron. If you wanted to detect a single electron, that's where you need to be. If you want to detect a single proton, so if you want to do single proton MRI, that's, that's your line. And the only thing that kind of rests there is, is the NV, so just about. It's not, not comfortable to say we can you know, detect you know, with the, uh, high signal noise, but it is there. So it has the precision to be able to do this. 
And this has to do with, again, the interfacing question. How close can we come? Look, the, the reason we're touching this line is not because the NV center is very sensitive, but because it can be very small. It can come to a very small contact. All right. So here's one example of how NV centers are used. This is a cantilever, just like an atomic force microscope, but instead of topological bend as you go over objects and measuring the, the deflection of your atomic force microscope, you have a tiny little uh, NV center in this diamond film, and you look from the top. When you look from the top, this is how it looks. It's bright. It's like a single trapped ion. It's nature's trapped ion. It's trapped in diamond with no other elements required to keep it in place. It's always there, always active. And you have this cantilever and you just scan over a surface and you get magnetic image coming from that material underneath. And it can be as close as you know, a few tens of nanometers, essentially. And, and that's an example image on top of a, uh, uh, of a magnetic material and you're imaging the stray field vectorially. That's the nice thing about the, the NV center. You can actually get a full vectorial map of the field on top of a magnetic material. Even if it's antiferromagnetic, in fact, you can capture the, uh, uh, the, the spin texture underneath and understand at the nanoscale. And the biggest wins in this is that your measurement device is a single electron spin. So it's back action to the material you're measuring is on the order of one electron. What you're measuring is probably hundreds of electrons equivalent. So the back action is, is removed. So it's a nice, clean, undisturbed image that you can get as opposed to magnetic force imaging, for example. And here is uh, here's a superconducting uh, material, thin film, very thin superconducting material. And if you look at, uh, again, if you do the same experiment uh, on this material in, under different conditions, you can actually resolve vortices opening up, superconducting vortices opening up in the field. Uh, in this otherwise superconductor. So it's very nice. You can actually capture uh, these uh, uh, spin textures or, or, or magnetic phenomena in nanoscale uh, using these uh, systems. And I'll, sh I'll show one more thing. Let me see how am I doing with time? Good. Um, so instead of a tip, you can also say, I, I'm not, I'm, I don't want to bring my detector to the object. I like to bring the object to my detector. For that one, uh, this is also another modality of measurement with NV centers. Uh, you, you place them very close to a surface on the order of five nanometers. All right. And then you say, okay, I'm, I'm ready. Let's put something on it and let's measure that something. Now the interaction, this is the uh, funny thing about the EMV centers, it's, it measures dipo in a dipolar fashion. So it will measure what's up here, but it's not going to measure what's up there of the same species because it's too far off. If it's too far, the signal is, is, is vanishingly small, so the NV center won't detect it. So it has a naturally small integration volume for detection. And what people have done, particularly Harvard, uh, is demonstrate that if you put a, a solution, a, a, a complex solution on top of a, a diamond surface with very shallow implanted NV centers, uh, engineered uh, around five nanometers, you can actually detect the spin of hydrocarbon chains as they land on top of your your NV center, okay? And this is, what you're seeing here is, this is from 1913, you're seeing a five nanometer cube volume, world's smallest NMR machine, where you're measuring uh, different species, oil, PMMA, you know, hydrogen atoms, and all that. So this is MRI with a five nanometer uh, uh, characteristic length scale. And of course, you can take it much larger, so that's single NV talking to a very small thing, but you can have an ensemble of these NV centers, and you can look at macro things, like uh, these worms, live bacteria, that actually eat iron. So they, they eat things and they produce iron, but they don't get rid of it. So they, they have iron in their bodies, and then these iron actually, the iron deposits align with the Earth's magnetic field. So it's a, <laughs> it's a funny system on its own. And they're able to measure uh, the only way to see it, of course, is to do uh, uh, scanning electron microscopy like, like they've done here, but you, you kill the species, of course, when you put it into an electron microscope. Uh, by doing it like this with a, with a diamond film right here, this is our uh, effectively diamond film uh, with the shallow implant, but high density, you can actually map out uh, the orientation of, the, uh, of these iron deposits inside this line as, as the thing wobbles on in, the, uh, in your sample. Anyway, so I, I think I justified diamond is good and it will be around for many different applications. I want to finish off, last few minutes, I want to finish off with something that has nothing to do with diamond, but 
uh, really taking, back to, uh, taking us back to the main message. The main mes message was quantum optics. And I want to highlight one very odd feature of quantum optics and how it has also impacted our technology. All right? And that is noise. Right? Everything I talked about was signal, improving signal, isolating signal, and now for the final uh, punchline, we're going to talk about noise. So if I talk about light, we can talk about the quantumness of light. We always talk about the wave and particle nature, right? It's always the, the debate has been going on for decades, you know, centuries. You know, you had Huygens' beautiful experiments and, and ingenious idea of Huygens wavelets and Young's experiments, Fresnel, Fraunhofer, everyone experimentally demonstrating that light is wave. And then you have Newton claiming that light is corpuscular for no good reason, because it's simply authority. But aside from that, the, you know, we now know that light is made of particles, photons, if you uh, treat it that way. But the interesting thing is there is more to the story of the quantumness of light than just whether it's wave or particle. It's this part. It's what happens to the, if, you, if you zoom in and, and look, the noise on it, that's where quantumness is. So there's, there's more quantumness buried in the fact that there is noise that you can't get rid of. It's not the classical noise, there's quantum noise, and that's interesting on its own. And what happened was, in 1975, Horace Yuen uh, came up with the idea that the fundamental limit of noise in any object, in any physical system, is probably vacuum, vacuum noise. And he came up with the idea that if you use light and nonlinear optics, you can take the absolute limit of noise and squeeze it. You can make it less. It comes at the expense of something. Of course, it comes at the expense of noise being larger somewhere else. So it really is the concept of squeeze. That's the word, the technical word is squeezing. So you take the uncertainty and you, uh, you take this, whatever this, this segment is, that's how uncertain you will be set by quantum physics, set by vacuum fluctuations. And he says, if you employ nonlinear process in, in materials, you can actually take this and make it much smaller and maybe uh, noise fluctuations in and out of plane will be much larger, fine, but you, 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 the volume is preserved, think of it that way. There's no uh, breaking of fundamental laws here, but you can choose an axis where there is no noise or there's very little noise, and that's called squeeze light. And people have demonstrated this, and now it's, uh, th that, that squeezing is such a way that it's, it's like a, a thin line, think of it that way. You start from a circle of noise, and now it's squeezed to the point where it's not even an ellipse, it's, a, it's that extended complete light. But the catch here, uh, the, the nice thing is 1980, in 1980, Carlton Caves, Carl Caves, came up with an idea. And this is Carl then, when he came up with the idea, and this is Carl today. Great guy, fantastic guy. And he came up with the idea that if you could get rid of the quantum mechanical noise in an interferometer, you can do more sens sensitive detection. You can do more sensitive detection of things, or whatever that is. And this relies on the concept of squeezing. Interestingly, Horace Yuan did not come up with the word squeezing. He came up with the word coherent two-photon states, more technical. Uh, and then uh, Carl said, let's just call it squeezed, because that's what we're doing. We're squeezing the noise. All right? So he came up with it and said that the uncertainties in the two quadrature phases are unequal. That's the point. Right? And where could this be useful? It could be useful in LIGO. What is the biggest interferometer we have today, LIGO? What is the interferometer that's trying to measure the weakest possible signal? LIGO. Classically, you can make your interferometer as stable and as good as possible, but there is one catch. No matter what you do, you will have a beam splitter. But in an interferometer, light comes in and splits at a beam splitter and then combines again, right? At that beam splitter, there's two outputs, but there's also two inputs. Light goes in one of them, vacuum goes in the other. Classically, it means nothing goes in the other. Quantum mechanically, it means full vacuum noise goes in the other one. Uncontrolled vacuum noise feeds into your interferometer. That's your fundamental limit of sensitivity. So this is what Carl Caves was saying. If we actually feed in, instead of one beam splitting into two, why don't we start with two beams? One, the beam you want. That's going to carry your signal, your detection beam. Two, Squeezed vacuum. Let's make sure that we take the vacuum and squeeze it in the axis we care about so it doesn't affect uh, the uh, experiments. And this is a, an article from 1988. Squeeze light, recent successes, boost hopes for applications. And one of the applications that was uh, uh, boost, the, the, what was hoped was 
Gravity wave detectors approach the level of sensitivity needed for success. Squeeze light generation likely will have become routine and presumably employed in the efforts for LIGO. 1988. This is a paper from 2019. I wanted to highlight the author's list on, on how complicated these experiments can be. And interestingly, you might think that this, at this point, like in particle physics papers, you might think that it's alphabetical. It's not. If, you ca if you're careful, there is credit given in some random order to, uh, to a certain number of people, and then at some point it becomes alphabetical. So, so, so clearly these people did the work. Uh, I think those are the main ones that actually struggled with, uh, with the whole experiment. What they've shown is, is that reference, this is the best LIGO can ever do, is this black line of noise versus frequency, so it's like a noise spectrum, if you will, how good your system is. So this is what that, that profile is, all right? So you cannot, if your signal happens to be, if your, if your gravitational wave is at 100 hertz and it happens to be at this level, you wouldn't be able to detect it. That's what it says. That's the, the, the lowest the th threshold for detection. And they, when they put quantum enhanced sensitivity by putting in squeeze vacuum from one side and, and normal laser from the other, they're able to drop it down. Remember, this is logarithmic, so they're able to drop it down. And they use that to actually detect uh, the tight gravitation, gravitational wave. So squeeze light based gravitational wave detection has happened. It's the first direct observation of gravitational waves using squeeze vacuum states, essentially, by essentially using a nonlinear optics crystal to generate squeeze light. And what is squeeze light? What do we, when I say squeeze light, what do I mean by especially squeeze vacuum? It turns out squeeze vacuum is photon pairs, instead of vacuum, instead of zero, nothing, it is pairs of photons generated in a spontaneous parametric down conversion process, which is the process that got last year's Nobel Prize for uh, Bell's inequality experiments, Jade said, Greenberger, Horn, Zeiling, Zeilinger, and all that. So it's the same, uh, same tool that generates entangled states for us for years, for decades, and also quiets down our LIGO for gravitational wave detection. So with that, I'll leave off. Hopefully I convince you that the quantum optics toolbox that we had all this time is actually useful for future technologies. Thank you very much. <laughs>